our 2023 ABLE annual meeting. Um, this is our 14th anniversary. So next year is a big one. We're gonna be celebrating our 15th anniversary and we are working on our conference plans already. And so hopefully in the next month or so, we'll be able to share with you where we're gonna be next summer. But for now, just really happy to have you all here and great to see you and looking forward to the next couple of days online. And then for those of you who are able to join us um, three more days next week in person in Vancouver, Canada. I'm Tracy Penny Light. I'm the president and board chair at ABLE. And I've been with the organization pretty much since the beginning. And for those of you who I haven't met yet, um, I always like to start with a little story and really grateful to our colleague, Trent Batson, who was the founding president of ABLE. Back in about 2008, 2009, Trent and myself and Helen Chen and Darren Cambridge, who were doing e-portfolio work at the time, were in Park City, Utah. And we were running a three-day workshop on you know, sort of implementing e-portfolios. And we went out for dinner one night and Trent said, you know, we need to have an international organization, a community of practice for e-portfolio practitioners and researchers. And we all said, that's a great idea, Trent. And he said, wonderful. Which one of you would like to do it? <laughs> and we said, oh, no, 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 we don't have time to do that. But uh, we really support you in, in creating an organization, Trent. And so he did. He took that up and he started ABLE. And uh, it's just been a really rich and wonderful experience for those of us who have been part of the organization for a long time. And for those of you who might be newer to ABLE, we're just so looking forward to meeting and working with you. One of the hallmarks of this community is that we are very sherry. So um, early on, we all were kind of inventing from scratch and that's not the case any longer. So many of us have been doing e-portfolio work for almost, well, for me, 20 years. Um, some of us have been doing it for a little bit longer. And uh, we really have leveraged, I think, that learning in the ABLE community to serve colleagues who are just beginning. So there's, there's no need to reinvent the wheel. We're all here to support you. And, and I hope over the next couple of days and through the rest of our annual meeting that you'll have a lot of opportunities to meet one another, to talk about your initiatives, to ask questions. Um, if you're noodling on something and you're not sure where to go next, please reach out to any of us on the board and we would be more than happy to assist you. Um, I just want to go ahead and uh, really acknowledge the program committee for this year's conference. So you can see the, the list of fantastic colleagues on your screen. Really, this conference wouldn't have happened without them. And um, I just am so grateful and appreciative of all of their efforts and great thinking around what we could bring to you that would help you to do your work better and, and hopefully to deepen your thinking about e-portfolio practices, pedagogies, and, and perhaps research if you're doing that. So thank you so much to Helen and Amy, Christina, Kevin, Megan, Debbie, Patsy, Rachel, Candice, Terry, Eddie, Kathy, and Sarah for all of the great insight that they've shared over the last several months as we've brought this program together. The themes for this year's conference, as you all know, are things that continue to be pressing issues for us, not only in the ePortfolio community, but also in higher education more broadly. So since about last November, we've all been thinking about the role that generative artificial intelligence, specifically things like ChatGPT, might do to the work that we do in higher education. So one of the questions that, that comes up over and over again is, is this a crisis? Is this going to change higher education forever? You know, is it going to make it so our students aren't able to, uh, to really reflect on their learning and to contribute to the academy and to learning, which is really what we want them all to do because they might be relying on these tools to generate knowledge for them. We all know that um, AI can't do that. It's an aggregator, brings together information from various places. And so the conversations have been circling around, what does this mean for higher education in terms of the opportunities I think that it brings for us to leverage AI in service of learning? 
I probably lean a little bit more to the side of that this is an opportunity than this is a crisis because we've seen other technologies come into the fore in the past and we know that we've we've managed to to leverage them in different ways to facilitate learning. I think e-portfolios any portfolio practices and pedagogies give us a really unique opportunity to think about how we can maybe maybe mitigate some of the challenges that AI might present by engaging our students in really deep learning in reflective practices and encouraging them to make meaning out of their learning. ChatGPT can't do that for them. They bring unique learning and experiences, their knowledge, skills, and abilities to the table. And so the more I think we can privilege that and encourage them to feel like their voice really does matter, that may just help us to um, mitigate this new technology. We're going to have a panel on AI discussing this um, in our face-to-face -face session, but um, there will be lots of opportunities to for you to discuss. And I'm going to give you a, a chance in a second just to post some of the questions that you might have going into this year's meeting. Thinking about AI, that also leads to this notion of authentic assessment. And so how might ePortfolios really enable us to assess our students' learning authentically and with them at the center of the conversation. So I'm hoping to learn from you as much as from all of the presenters at this year's conference in terms of what you're doing and how ePortfolios may assist in the, these endeavors. Since the pandemic, I, I mean, I, I, I would like to argue that ePortfolios have always aimed to be an inclusive pedagogy because we've always really put students at the center of everything that we're doing. We want their knowledge and experiences to be highlighted. We want to see them shine through in their ePortfolio work. But we know since the pandemic that there are a number of inequities that exist not only in the in the academy but also in um, society more broadly and so what do inclusive pedagogies look like today um, after we've had a global pandemic and um, all the learning that's come from that so i think some of the work that our digital ethics task force here at able has has been working on can contribute to our thinking about this. And, um, and that also leads into this theme of design justice. How do we design in a way that is just for everyone? So um, some things for us to continue to think about. And I know for me as a white middle-class cisgender woman, it's something that I think about a lot because most of the students on the campus that I work at, or at least many of them, at least 50% of them, are international students and coming from different places than I came in and are also indigenous learners. So students who have grown up in different cultural traditions than I have. And so what are the opportunities there to engage those varieties of learners in, in our classrooms and in their e-portfolio practices? And then a theme always at ABLE is this notion of networking and making connections. And so really thinking about how you might leverage the learning from your colleagues in the different sessions to move forward your own initiatives. And so we'll give you some time and space to engage in some networking throughout this year's conference. So I wanna just take us into this first opportunity to, to work together to kind of crowdsource ideas about what you want to learn over the next few days. So um, what are your learning goals for attending ABLE? What questions do you have as you're coming into the conference? And we're gonna go ahead and post those thoughts on the Jamboard. So I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen for a moment so that I can put the link to the Jamboard in the chat for you. And then I'll pull the slides back up. But as I'm working behind the scenes here, what are, your learning goals for the rest of the conference and um, how might this conference be helpful for you in meeting those particular goals. Okay, hopefully you're seeing the Jamboard. Lots of great things here. I just thought this could be an opportunity for us to kind of reflect together so I see some, some uh, post-it notes that are circled, so I'll start with those. So the first in the center is, I'm intrigued by thinking about how to use AI in ePortfolio work. Me too. I definitely have some ideas, but uh, looking forward to hearing what you all are thinking. How to encourage authentic assessment via ePortfolios. Great. 
leadership buy-in, how to convince provosts, et cetera, that this is worthy of institutional resources. Yes, that's a big one for sure. I always come away with new ideas, things I didn't expect. So looking forward to learning from whatever happens here. Awesome. So other things include faculty buy-in for e-portfolios as assessment, ways to achieve student engagement while balancing university assessment needs, strategies for effective use of portfolios in the classroom, how to be more inclusive in all aspects of e-portfolio assignments while recognizing how my privilege affects my students. Yeah, our own positionality and privilege really do impact how we meet them and uh, how we design things to, to meet them where they're at. So such a good thing to wonder about. How to provide effective prompts for reflection. I think we can help you with that. Possible roadblocks to implementing ePortfolio across the curriculum. Yeah, it's a good one. Best practices for implementing portfolios in first year seminar programs. We definitely have some colleagues here to help with that. How to best blend the reasons teachers and students want to engage with e-portfolio making um, and how those align with administrative assessment needs. Uh, creating partnerships between faculty and student life for e-portfolio implementation. That whole notion of the whole student life cycle and where do e-portfolios fit. And sometimes our initiatives don't span across that whole life cycle, we might be engaged in portfolio work, you know, in the first year seminar, for instance, or at the beginning of general education, but what are the opportunities to leverage that learning across the whole student learning journey? Really important one. Understanding how to assess e-portfolio is a, a long-standing question. What, what does e-portfolio assessment look like and, and what are some of the best practices? How do we support students to do this work? This is great. Um, well, I know you all can read as well. So I wanted to just open up the floor for um, any reflections that you'd like to unmute and share, or you could also feel free to put them in the chat about questions that you really, really want answers to right this minute. Only that I'm excited to hear what people are exploring. And, you know, it's fun to see um, people coming with an open mind. I always get something great from the ABLE annual meeting, but other people who have specific needs. And this, as you mentioned before, we're <clears throat> a very sherry group, uh, not the kind that you might see in the cooking show, but the kind that uh, e-portfolio practitioners uh, do. But I, I think for those of you who may be first time attendees and participants at an ABLE conference, take Tracy's comments to heart. There is a big um, heart in front of everybody's name on the screen. And so feel free to ask folks, how do you tackle this challenge? How do you support students with this um, issue that they face? Um, because everyone is willing to tell you what they're doing, how it's worked, what hasn't worked, so you can avoid the pitfalls and more. Back to you, Penny. Thanks, Kevin. Candace, you look like you're unmuted as well. Do you want to say anything? No? I'm just really <laughs> excited to see um, people from different um, levels of experience with e-portfolios. I think, um, you know, I've been in this like um, Tracy and Kevin have been for a long time, and I'm always encouraged um, by the new ideas that come from people who actually are just beginning. So really looking forward to learning from all of you. Yeah, I think that's such a great point, Candace. We, you know, I think we, we engage that kind of thinking often when we're working with our students that, you know, we're going to learn something from them just as much as they're going to learn from us. And it's absolutely the same situation here. You, even if you're beginning, you've probably made some decisions or asking questions that we haven't thought of yet. So definitely, um, or we, we're not thinking about them in the same way that you are. So definitely don't hesitate to share and, uh, you know, to contribute and 
And as Kevin said, to ask any of us, I mean, I think that's the, the beauty of this community is, is that we are all working um, together and, and we're all kind of working in parallel. And one thing that I have noted over the years of, of my work in higher education is that academics sometimes, I think probably this is not the, the crew where this is the case, but sometimes because we're supposed to be experts, you know, there's a little hesitation to kind of ask because you worry that should I shouldn't I know the answer to this but the reality is this is a different kind of work than most of us do um, or have uh, sort of been trained to do as as academics if that was your your background so uh, definitely don't hesitate to reach out and, and to ask a question I, I always tell my students that I have a five minute rule so if you're trying to do something and you've spent five minutes and you couldn't figure it out please just ask and I and I'm a a dean now um, of, uh, at a university, and I say the same thing to my colleagues. Like, please don't waste your time. If you if you're kind of struggling with something for five minutes, just come and ask me. And if I don't know, I will figure out who who does know, so that you can be supported. So, same thing goes in this community. We we really want to support you. We value you and your input, and um, and are looking forward to uh, to learning from you. May I ask if anyone has any questions, burning questions before we head into our event? I do. Yes, I please go ahead. Right now, uh, we're starting a pilot in the fall. And the program that we use is student learning and licensure from Watermark. And the students need to send the link to their portfolio to somebody so we can view it. How do you monitor? How do you take care of all of these links from students. Yeah, and our pilots one thing, but when we open it up. <laughs> How many students will you have, do you think, sharing their links? Um, I'm gonna say right now, probably about a hundred, 200. We haven't quite met, um, figured out exactly what classes, but I'm I'm assuming it's going to be a, a couple hundred. So um, will you have uh, instructors, faculty members kind of working with the students within their individual courses? And then have you got a learning management system that you're using in parallel with Watermark? Um, we, we use Canvas. Canvas, yeah. So one strategy might be to um, have the um, faculty who are teaching those courses to have drop boxes specifically for the portfolio that um, could be a place for them to to be stored. Um, I don't know how Canvas works on your your campus, but um, sometimes students continue to have access to their courses. Sometimes they don't after the course ends. So yeah, that might be cool. one way to do it. Yeah. Um, the other thing that comes to mind is having a shared, e you know, a, a specific email where you have students submit oh, their cool. links and then identifying um, some point person or people to monitor that email so that, you know, imagining there's going to be a moment in time where you're going to go in and assess all of those portfolios. And so you could potentially have a shared email um, address at students, you know, like I'm thinking portfolio at your school, you know, and, um, and that would be one central kind of repository for storing portfolios. So those are two ideas that come to mind for me. Um, Kevin or anyone else on the call that's doing anything that could assist. Well, I do like those ideas, though. That's okay, though. Hey, <laughs> we'll, keep, out. we'll keep thinking about it. And please do um, feel free to reach out to, to me or any of the, the team here for more specifics. And if you want, one thing that we always say is that if you want to run ideas by any of us, we're, we're happy to do that. So, um, yeah, and I know um, I see in the chat here, Rebecca has posted that keeping everything in the LMS is easiest for both the students and the faculty and can increase buy-in. So I think um, where I would start is, you know, what are the, what's your goal in collecting um, these ePortfolios links and how long do you need to have them for? And then that might help guide you in your decision-making about where to store them. Um, Peter also adds that we're doing something like this and um, has put his email. Peter. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, everyone. You're welcome. And it looks like Kate had her hand up. I'm oh, sorry, I didn't. Go ahead. Okay. 
I was going to respond to Jeanette. I started typing in the chat, but it took too many words. Um, <laughs> so I'm at Connecticut College, um, Jeanette, and we have a similar uh, issue where our e-portfolios are really the um, the kind of trademark of our um, integrative pathway program, which uh, spans across multiple semesters, which is why the e-portfolio is so powerful and students lose access to the Moodle and so do instructors after they've completed the, the course. So we use Google Sites and what I've done is for each of those courses, I will create a meta portfolio um, that during the e-portfolio onboarding session, when I go in and do the training with the students, I show them the, the um, this kind of meta site and I ask them to plug their links into the meta site while I'm there. And then the ins I give that site to the instructor. And so the instructor of that course who follows them across multiple semesters keeps the e-portfolios in this kind of separate Google site that has all of the students. And then the beauty of this as well is if the students choose to share with one another, they can access each other's e-portfolios within kind of a shared community of practice space. Um, so that, that has been useful and we have to divorce it from the LMS for it to work. Um, so that's another way to go about it. I like that idea because we also turn our courses off and the students wouldn't have access. Thank you. I love this group problem solving. Thank you so much for, for sharing and thanks for the question, Jeanette. Are there any other questions?